Welcome to our review on chemical reactions. The first thing we're going to look at is something that you often see associated with chemical equations when you see them written, and that's something called a state symbol. The state symbols are included because they tell us the physical state of the substances that are actually involved in that chemical reaction. And there are four that you need to know for your exam. So solids have an S in brackets, liquids have an L in brackets, gases a G in brackets, and if it's an aqueous solution, it's AQ in brackets. And I've given you an example of how we'd see them used in an equation at the bottom there. When we actually come to talk about equations, then there's a few different types that we're going to use in chemistry. The first one is actually the simplest, and yet the one that people tend to throw away the marks on really frequently on the exam. So the first one we're going to look at are word equations. The key thing is that word, word. It's going to give us the names of the reactants and the products. The way people throw away the marks in this is as opposed to writing the full names, they get lazy and write the formula. So they think, oh, I'm not going to write carbon dioxide, and they just write CO2. Goodbye to that mark, because CO2 isn't a word. Therefore, it's not going to be a word equation. So just make sure that you use the full names when you're writing a word equation. To give you an idea of the kind of question we could see on the exam paper to do with our word equations, I've given you one here. So copper carbonate decomposes when heated to make copper oxide and carbon dioxide. Write a word equation for this reaction. First thing we're going to do is highlight, circle, underline, whatever you have handy or you like doing, the key bits of information there. So you can see what I've done there is I've underlined and made bold the word make because that's telling us what we're actually making. So before that, we've got the red bit, which is copper carbonate. That's going to be our reactant. And anything after the make is the product. So we've got copper oxide and carbon dioxide in green. As soon as you've identified those key bits of information, all you need to do is copy those names onto the answer line, put an arrow between your reactants and your products, and a plus between anything that's more than one on each side. So you can see copper carbonate with an arrow because that's where it's making, copper oxide plus carbon dioxide. If you do that, you get the marks every time. Before we go on any further looking at the other types of equation, then we need to have a little break to think about what's happening in this chemical reaction. Now, I've given you an example here where on the left, you can see we've got two colorless liquids with a combined mass of 92.95 grams. And on the right, we've combined them together in one beaker, which has now changed. It's had a chemical reaction, but the mass is still 92.95 grams. We've made a precipitate in the one on the right, which is quite simply an insoluble solid, which is produced when we have a reaction that involves solutions. And this is just demonstrating a really important principle in chemistry, which is the law of conservation of mass. And that just tells us that when we're talking about any chemical reaction at all, then atoms cannot be created or destroyed. All that happens in that chemical reaction is the way they're joined together will be changed. So that means that however much we had at the beginning in terms of the mass of our reactants will always have to be the same as the total mass of the products. When we're thinking about how we can actually investigate things like the law of conservation of mass, then we need to think about where we're carrying out reactions. One of the ways we do this is using what's called a closed system. Now that quite simply is a container in which no substance can either enter or leave during the reaction. So it would be the beakers I showed you there because none of the products were gases, so they don't get lost. Or if we are making a gas, then we'd have to have a flask with a gas syringe attached, so everything is still contained within those objects. If we were to have something where the substances could enter and leave during the actual reaction, then we have a non-enclosed system. Now that we understand the law of conservation of mass, we can go on to look at this idea of balanced symbol equations. Now, this is the one that's going to tell us how the atoms are arranged within the reactants and the products, 
and it also tells us the relative amounts of each substance involved. This is probably the one that you've heard me say balance symbol equation, you're rolling your eyes and groaning a little bit because you all seem to hate them. But we're going to go through it one step at a time so you can understand how to do this and therefore get the marks for it in the exam. Let's start off with an example of a reaction. So we're going to look at the reaction of calcium carbonate with hydrochloric acid, which forms calcium chloride, water and carbon dioxide. So the first thing we need to do is just write the symbols in the right places. Now, on your exam paper, they're not going to expect you to memorize every chemical in the world. They're going to give you any of the unfamiliar ones. If they're familiar chemicals like carbon dioxide, water, then they're going to expect you to know those. But anything that's unfamiliar, they will give to you in the question. So the symbol equation for this one is just at the bottom there. CaCO3 plus HCl makes CaCl2 plus H2O plus CO2. Now, the good news is that if the balance symbol equation question is worth two marks, by just doing that without any balancing at all, you've got one of those two marks. So don't leave them blank. Always get the actual formulas for the chemicals written down as the first port of call. Second stage then is we need to count the number of each element on each side. Now, one of the easiest ways I find to do this with my classes is use the arrow as your dividing line and put a line down and then literally write down the symbols for each element in the same order on both sides of that line and then count up how many you've got, just like I've done in the example at the bottom there. Then what we need to do is have a look and see, do the numbers on the left match the numbers on the right? And in this case, the hydrogen and the chlorine don't. So that means we need to balance it. The key thing to remember about how to balance this is the only place we can actually put numbers is in front of any whole chemical. You can't put them in the middle because then you're changing the chemical itself. So you can only put it in front to multiply that whole chemical by two, three, four, whatever it may be. Then all we need to do is work out what number works. So if we have a look, then we could see that in our example, we've got obviously one hydrogen and one chlorine on the left, but two hydrogens and two chlorines on the right. So hopefully when you look at the left hand side there, you can see the hydrogen and the chlorine are together in the hydrochloric acid. So if there's only one of each of them, but we need two, all we need to do to balance it is put a two in front of the HCl. That then means we've got two hydrogens and two chlorines on the left, two of each on the right, three oxygens on each side, one carbon, one calcium on each side. It's done. And that then gets you your second mark. And what you normally find is that the ones they're going to ask you to do on your exam paper at GCSE level, it's almost always going to be twos that are involved in the balancing. They're not going to give you one that requires like 13 of a particular chemical. If you're getting into those numbers, you've gone wrong. So cross it out, start again. Hopefully at the end of this video, you can now write word equations and balance symbol equations. And you also can recall what the law of conservation of mass is.